Welcome everyone. My name is Adam. I'm the founder of Startup Network Europe. It's an absolute pleasure to see you all here today. Uh, a very quick introduction. Uh, Startup Network Europe makes webinars for European startups, uh, which attract thousands of founders and investors. Uh, today, we're actually launching the European AI community, uh, which is a community online for AI experts, founders and investors, and it will be part of a much larger European startup community. Uh, we are co-hosting this event with the Transatlantic AI Exchange, a platform that accelerates and expands the global economic, social and academic leadership of Germany and the USA in the human machine economy. Through webinars, workshops, conferences, and one-to-one -one coaching, they foster exchange on AI between entrepreneurs, researchers, investors, and policymakers. Intel Ignite, a global corporate startup program for early stage startups launched in 2019 by Intel, first debuting in Tel Aviv, and later expanding to Germany and the US. They help turn cutting edge ideas into industry disrupting technologies by giving ambitious entrepreneurs the hands-on mentorship, technical support, and business acumen they need to build world-changing companies. And uh, twice a year, this may be of interest to some of you, they invite cohorts of 10 early stage startups to gather in their offices where they immerse them in 12 weeks of workshops, entering sessions, and networking events tailored to their needs. And Intel Software is our other sponsor, and they aim to connect the worldwide community of developers on all things software and hardware, uh, shape the future of technology to help create a better future for the entire world, and push forward in fields like AI, analytics, and cloud to edge technology. So folks, our plan for today is very simple. It's a two hour event with 25 different speakers in just two hours. Uh, our first hour will have AI leaders, VCs, and we'll hear about Intel's uh, global startup and developer community outreach program. And then in our second era, we will have some AI startup and scale up founders, incubators, angel investors, and experts in governance, privacy, and ethics. Uh, we have actually a link that I will share in the chat box, uh, which has a list of all our sponsors, uh, speakers, all our upcoming events, and uh, also more information about the European AI community. Thank you, Adam, again. Uh, good morning and good evening to the audience and a big welcome to all 24 speakers today who offer to share their time and knowledge to all of you over the next two hours. Uh, my name is Thomas Neubert. I'm born and raised in Germany, a longtime entrepreneur living in Silicon Valley for over 30 years now. I'm the founder of the Transatlantic AI Exchange and also working at Intel's headquarter in Santa Clara, Silicon Valley, in the data center and AI cloud execution and strategy group. And yes, that's a mouthful. The first EU AI conference is targeting Europe innovators, innovation ecosystems, connecting them to the US particularly to Silicon Valley. A month ago, the European Commission presented the European Chips Act to foster homegrown secure technologies. 20% of the global microchip production should come from Europe by around 2030. That is twice as much as today, and the market will double during the next decade. With focus on fundamental research, efficiency, new technologies, and market applications, the plan is to build an EU-wide network. All this requires a whole European approach. 43 billion euro of public investments will be support the CHIP sect until 2023, uh, 2030, sorry, and 80 billion euro total over the next decades across the entire semiconductor value chain will go into R&D manufacturing and advanced packaging. All this will create well-paid jobs, but equally important is that it will build a foundation to also nurture research and equally important startup opportunities. And that's why we are here. Allow me to provide a quick overview of our Transatlantic AI Exchange uh, initiative. As Adam already mentioned earlier, the Transatlantic AI Exchange, we call it TIKES, is a platform that aims at accelerating and expanding the transatlantic knowledge exchange in the human to machine economy. We call it the so-called fourth industrial revolution. We foster exchanges on innovation, especially digital transformation and AI, creating the grounds for entrepreneurs, researchers, investors, small medium businesses and policymakers to build long-term partnerships. Again, a big thank you to our sponsor, Intel, 
who will share some exciting information about our developer community and the global startup program called Ignite. Ignite's mission is to accelerate groundbreaking startups. Knowledge is for sharing, and we are always looking for interesting speakers, moderators, industry experts, and most importantly, valuable, interesting topics for our events. So please email us or add comments on our LinkedIn page about topics that you seem of interest that we should put into our program. At this time, we have two upcoming events already listed on our website. Plus, we have decided because of the background to also have a third one. So based on the incredible response over the last three months, we are also excited to announce that we will be hosting a second EU AI Summit in October. If you have ideas about specific topics or areas of interest, please let us know via email or leave a message on LinkedIn after this event. A post-event LinkedIn message will be sent out right after this event. So please keep an eye on it. Now, I am super excited to announce the following. At Tykes, we decided to offer three awards in 2022. People can win a combination of up to $1,000 cash and up to six hours of mentorships from our experts virtually or hosted by us during a visit to either Silicon Valley or Hamburg, Germany. Anyone is eligible who has shared and attended two full one hour Tykes sessions and is following Tykes, the Transatlantic AI Exchange on LinkedIn. The winner will be announced in January, 2023. Now, with that said, let's introduce our first set of speakers who will share valuable information about governmental and high level programs. With that, I would like to open up the first session with Oliver Schramm, the Consul General of Germany in San Francisco, Holger Hus, the co-founder and chair of the board of Claire, and professor in machine learning and university in Leiden, and Jayan Narajan, manager of the World Economics Forum Global AI Action Alliance. Oliver, please take it from here. Thank you very much. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Thomas Adam, thank you very much for having me today. And it is really heartening and it's great to see how far the Transatlantic AI Exchange Initiative has advanced. And uh, I remember last year we, we supported a spot and sponsored a series of webinars together with Tykes. And it's wonderful to see how much of momentum uh, this initiative has gained under your leadership, Thomas. So how about Germany and I from a political point of view? <clears throat> um, the federal government of Germany has adopted a set of measures to promote AI in our country. In 2018, the government at that, of that time uh, under Chancellor Merkel published and released its first national AI strategy. This strategy has been updated in December 2020 and its main aim is uh, with a view to further transfer and application of AI, especially towards small and medium enterprises and with a raise that has now been agreed to from 3.5 million to 5 billion US dollar in uh, up to 2025. I think we are on good track in Germany in the area of AI. According to the latest artificial intelligence index report published recently, by the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI. Germany ranks third regarding AI skill penetration with the prevalence of AI skills across all occupations. Um, of course, number one spot taken by and number two by India and the US. According to this report, the US led the world in overall private investment in funded AI companies with 52.8 billion US dollars, but Germany ranked fifth with 1.98 billion US dollar. The German company Salonis was among the four AI companies that received the largest private investments in 2021, a big success. Nevertheless, there's a lot of potential for Germany to accelerate the uptake of AI. With the new government having taken office a few months ago in December, there's new momentum for political measures in the field in, in AI. And I think we should use this momentum. And I think that is also why this conference today comes at a very timely moment. 
The new government has demonstrated a strong interest in AI. For instance, last week, Chancellor Olaf Scholz has visited the German Research Center for Artificial, Artificial Intelligence, DFKI, in Kaiserslautern in Southeast Germany. And the German government has significantly stepped up its commitment to future technologies like AI and will increase, as I mentioned, its, its investments in AI from three to five billion by euros, I, um, I beg your pardon, euros by 2025. And interesting corporations take place in Europe too, of course. I have noticed with a lot of interest that the European AI Research Network, founded by Holger Hoes, has announced last week that it will strengthen its cooperation with the Robotics Association, Eurobotics. And I'm curious to hear what, Helga, what Holger will tell us about it a little later. When talking about leadership in AI, we should not forget the role that legislation and regulation play in the field of AI. Europe is an important player when it comes to setting standards. Many rules set by the European Union have become the gold standard, followed by other legislators, uh, legislators, for instance, the General Data Protection Reg Regulation, GDPR, that has influenced the Californian privacy legislation as well. It is likely that also rules governing AI set by Brussels will have an impact beyond the borders of the European Union. In April of last year, the European Commission presented its proposal for a European AI Act. Germany supports the European AI Act and its multi-layered risk-based approach. For us, it is important that new rules are designed to be a innovation friendly and be easy to implement. And lastly, and importantly, at the same time, safeguard digital civil rights. Hence, in its coalition agreement, the new German government has declared that biometric identification in public spaces and public sector social scoring systems need to be banned by EU law. In conclusion, I think there's a lot of good ground to cover a lot to talk about in transatlantic relations between Europe and the US. And there are great signals and developments coming out of Germany these days. With this, I don't only refer to Intel's fantastic announcement uh, of its investment in Magdeburg or to Elon Musk's Riga factory that opened today near Berlin, but rather or mostly by breathtaking success stories like that of German startup Aleph Alpha in Heidelberg, raising enormous amounts of money since it started in 2019, operationalizing large AI systems toward generalizable AI, enabling public and private sector to run their own AI experiments and develop new business models. And uh, with a strong commitment to open source communities, academic partnerships and ethical uh, standard support uh, to support fair access to, uh, to modern AI research. I think <clears throat> that's a great way forward and in, in an inspiring perspective for transatlantic AI exchange too. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Oliver. Over to Holger, please. Hi, Holger. Hey, it's a privilege and a pleasure to be here. In fact, I'm no longer mostly at Leiden University. I'm speaking to you from Aachen in Germany, where I am in the great position to benefit from one of these mechanisms men mentioned by Oliver, a so-called Alexander von Humboldt professorship, which I just took up uh, in January. Um, I'd like to share with you just a, a few very quick thoughts uh, on why European excellence in AI is important, not only for Europe, but also beyond. And in order to illustrate this, I want to make two quick arguments. The first is that, um, you know, in, in our world, competition is actually a good thing. What we don't want is monopolies, and especially we don't want monopolies in areas uh, of great public uh, and industrial importance. Um, a very good example for that uh, was the almost monopoly in the aviation industry um, earlier in the last century. Um, as we know, a very determined European push has made this into an effective duopoly. And I would claim that we are all better off for it in terms of having more modern aircraft, safer aviation, uh, and also more affordable air travel uh, at our disposal. And so it is with AI, except that AI is, of course, much more important and much more versatile uh, than aviation is. 
Um, in particular, I think European activities in AI are extremely important because of the kind of AI that Europe is pushing for. And of course, Europe is not alone in this. Um, Oliver already mentioned um, the Stanford uh, Center for, uh, for Human-Centered AI. Uh, and, and of course, such efforts exist not only in the United States, but um, basically around the globe. However, uh, Europe and European member and EU member states um, have uh, made a very strong and public commitment to value-aligned, human-centered, and trustworthy AI. And as an AI scientist, I strongly believe this is the kind of AI that we need most. What we need is AI for good, AI that doesn't just create economic value. Of course, we want this. This is important for society as well. But AI that beyond that um, is actually aimed at helping us meet the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals because reaching these goals will help us to meet some of the biggest challenges that as societies around the globe, we share in common, such as climate change, such as the current pandemic and future ones to come, such as diversity, inclusion, and the responsible sharing of information. Finally, I think it's very important to embrace a notion of AI for all, and this is AI that isn't just to the benefit of the shareholders of a few large companies, but AI that is broadly relevant and beneficial to society. And the best way to do that, in my opinion, is, a, is to have and establish a strong, vibrant AI ecosystem that spans the globe, that spans all sectors of economy, that spans I and mean, connects um, companies of all sizes, and that, yes, also prominently includes the public sector. AI is something that very much will determine the quality of life for everyone going forward. And therefore, everybody has a stake. The public has a stake, has a stake private companies have a stake. And it's very important that we align this um, around something that we can all believe in and push jointly for. I think AI for all and AI for good are two areas in which we can come together in this way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olga. Great feedback, appreciate that. Jayant, uh, what do you have to say from the point of view of the World Economic Forum? Thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas, Adam, and the Transatlantic AI Exchange for having me here. Uh, and a very warm hello to my fellow speakers as well as all the participants. Um, so the World Economic Forum, where I manage the Global AI Action Alliance, um, is, is facilitating public-private cooperation as well as international cooperation on the topic of artificial intelligence. Um, and no matter which leader we speak to, not just in EU or, or the US, uh, across all countries, AI is very much at the heart of every technology transformation discussion that we have. Um, from the forum, we are, we are very much like a lot of the things that Oliver and Holger said is also something that is aligned with the views that the forum also sort of uh, aligns with and, and works closely with, with its partners and with its stakeholders. Um, but when we look at this topic of artificial intelligence, then Oliver, you mentioned that briefly, one of the, the most important pillars here is also the funding and investments that are going in. And, and this is where we are seeing that the US, at least um, the AI startups still lead on that front in, in terms of the amount of investments that have been received. Um, as per a report by OECD, I think US AI startups have received 174 billion in funding between uh, 2012 and 2022. So, so in 10 years, that's the amount of money that's gone in. And, and we, we know that this is something that even governments have a role to play in. Even if you look at the government spending as well as the spending of European governments in the American side or the European government, there's a lot of money going into artificial intelligence. Uh, for the US government, the amount of money that was spent in 2021 uh, was around 6 billion. Um, and that was already a 50% increase from the past year. And the European spending and the current rate at which it's going will also go beyond 20 million or 21 million by next year. Um, and it's important to see when we're talking to investments, obviously a lot of this money is flowing into startups, but also a lot of money is being invested by bigger as well as medium-sized companies in their technology transformation journey. And when we speak of investments in AI, this is not just investments in the development of the technology solution itself, it's also the associated assets like infrastructure, like computing capacity, which you really need to, to, to scale up artificial intelligence and machine learning solutions. So a lot of movement on the investment side, and I think that, that's critical to really create a thriving ecosystem and that market, which can then also create jobs for all the skilled workers that, that, that are also actually being invested in over a medium to longer term horizon. 
because that's also one of the challenges that we see across all regions. Um, this is not a short-term game. You can't develop data in AI scientists over six months. Sure, you can, uh, you can, you can uh, equip them with some skills, but not all of them. So that's, that's one important element on the investment side. The other thing that we are also seeing is um, in terms of the transatlantic AI exchange truly, um, and, and Holger also mentioned this, AI, uh, sorry, Europe is really leading in terms of how they are developing these AI solutions based on values, uh, based on democratic values. And this is also something that was based, this was uh, discussed in the Technology and Trade Council meeting, which happened in 2021 between the EU and the US on, on the cooperation re needed between these regions on creating innovation and AI solutions based on these common values. Um, and this would very well also help as the world looks towards the EU, as the EU's AI Act will become a law after it's debated and discussed in the parliament. And it will also be important from a global perspective to have some sort of alignment on that regulation because technology and companies work in a global setting. And we are already seeing some sort of similarities, for example, between the FTC guidelines in the US related to algorithms and some of the facets of the EU's AI Act. And I think there'll be closer cooperation needed over there uh, in the interest of businesses, as well as in the interest of governments. So striking that balance really. Um, and when we look at industry level cooperation, um, Oliver, again, you brought up some examples. One of the examples that I believe some participants and speakers here might already be aware of is for example, the Melody Consortia in EU, uh, which is an initiative on drug discovery involving European pharma companies. And the goal here is to really accelerate drug discovery by sharing the world's la largest collection of small molecules by building a flexible, scalable, and secure framework for federated privacy-based and privacy-preserving machine learning. Um, and efforts like this, taking them beyond the EU and facilitating this in terms of a closer cooperation between EU and the US would be, would be extremely helpful because this is how you then also lead the way at a more global level. Um, so these are some of the thoughts and the forum will continue to play its role in, in helping this cooperation at, at the international level as much as possible and building the bridges between the private sector and the government and striking this balance between innovation um, as well as governance of, of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate the first panel discussion. I learned a lot and I would like to invite all of you, including the upcoming speakers, to create an individual type session to for a deeper dive one hour the conversation with more you know not more than three to four people there's so much uh, to explore here um we are right on time that's very really good let's go to the next panel let's dive a little bit deeper from the micro level down to the individual sections uh, ceos from startup companies the next one is going to be the investment community represented by three excellent uh, VCs with lots of experiences. The first one up is Andreas Unselt, the partner at UVC Partners in Munich, Germany. Then there is uh, Samir Kumar, he's the general manager of M12, which is Microsoft Ventures. And then there's Rashmi Gopinath, he's the general manager at uh, B Capital Group. And I would like to introduce uh, Andreas uh, first. Hello, good evening to, yourself, uh, to, to you all and Thomas, thanks a lot for having me here. I first want to chat quickly about what we're currently seeing in trends concerning um, European uh, AI startups and then elaborate a little bit on where we think that we could deepen the transatlantic partnerships. So generally speaking, the first wave of AI companies that has come up in the last five to six years was especially companies for, for implementing AI in vertical solutions. Um, and that's mainly companies that grow to a certain stage, um, become very relevant for consumer, but also um, B2B technologies. Um, and I think there is there's a new trend where uh, we see more and more, let's say platform AI startups that really try to build either a startups that uh, a, a technology that helps uh, EU to be um, more independent from other regions 
or with the ambition to really bring their technology to a global scale. And I think what's very interesting here is, and um, the previous speaker mentioned this already, that this new wave of AI will also integrate um, European values and standards, which are, for my opinion, um, unique and could be very helpful for, for, for other regions. So what, what's for me, um, and now focusing on venture capital, the, the key things, maybe not only looking what we could do better, but already what, what works very, very good. Um, I think we've learned a lot from US entrepreneurs over the last two to three decades. Honestly, I think starting the whole European um, startup ecosystem was only possible because US and especially Silicon Valley really gave us a hand and helped us a lot in learning how um, startups and, and also venture capital works. That went mainly by having German entrepreneurs visiting Silicon Valley, but also other regions in the US, but also founding their companies there, collecting experience, coming back to Germany, being active as angels, VCs, but for serial entrepreneurs. I think the European startup ecosystem has matured a lot over the last 10 years. And now it would be probably time to have more US entrepreneurs coming to European Union and starting their companies here, which will again give, give us a, a huge boost. So that would be my, my first vision, first invitation. I think the second thing is also um, the venture capital scene has matured a lot. I mean, we are an example for this. When we started in 2011 as a young venture firm, we had 25 million in fund size. And everybody was wow, saying wow, because that time a private fund with 25 million in size was, was really astonishing in the area of deep tech. Now we have 10 times the size and we're just a medicore fund in terms of, of size. But still what we see is that when we are building unicorns, and we're building more and more unicorns, are just, we, we've just crossed over a hundred unicorns in Europe um, last year, that we need US funding and international VC firms to also support that firms because we still don't have that huge um, funding here in Europe. But I think now it's the time for, and, and, and this partnership is working a lot and I think can be improved partially, but, but I think that that's on the right track. I think now it would be great for um, US um, LPs becoming more accessible for our venture scene here. This is also working partially, but still for us, it's very hard to go to US and to fundraise. Um, and I hope uh, to see a, a lot more um, cross-border LP investments uh, in, in, in the next 10 years. I think what, what, what we are seeing as a trend, and I mentioned this a little bit before, is that we have more and more really large startup scale-ups that are also going to internationalize to, to the United States. Um, and I think where we could support us is that we see a lot of US startups are staying US, maybe for good reasons, because their home market's really huge and only the very, very large companies really then come to Europe and, and the other way around. But we see more and more also of our portfolio thinking about once we did our initial um, internationalization within Europe, that the United States is, 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 is the next target market, but it's still very costly and very complex and we're still lacking experience how to internationalize fast in the US. And maybe I see the, the same problem um, for medium or smaller size US startups coming to Europe. And I think um, having a community in, in both directions where we could help those startups um, getting to know the, the ecosystems here and, and, and starting maybe from Munich to then scale uh, to, to, to whole Europe and for a German startup, maybe starting in, in San Francisco and then scaling to GS yes, um, would, would be very, really a thing where we could help um, our startups to, to really grow faster. So Great. That, that would be my three wishes and I hope I'm in time. Th thanks, Thomas. Thank you very much, Andreas, appreciate it. Over to Samir. Thanks, Thomas. So, um, you know, I think it's fair to say that, yes, there's always a need for more capital in Europe, bigger rounds, bigger VCs. 
But I think if you look at 2020 to 2021, we saw an almost 200% increase in the number of US, US VCs participating in European deals. And you know, no small numbers, over 70 billion dollars or 70 billion euros uh, worth of VC deals, over, which I think is about over 2000 deals in which US VCs were involved. Um, so the number is growing at a healthy clip, but there are still opportunities for improvement. Um, certainly one area that I've kind of researched and reflected on is when you think about European LPs and especially things like pension funds, we need to see a greater allocation of European pension funds taking positions uh, in uh, VC funds and allocating capital like they do uh, in the US. I think that will be a great catalyst for seeing larger funds, more uh, funding activity happening in Europe. So that's one thing I would call out. Um, I, you know, as I was listening in on this panel and previous speakers, it's very true that Europe is leading the charge in thinking about values and ethics around AI. And certainly that is now also coming up in regulatory um, motions that are happening. You know, the, the big A, um, AI regulation that happened at the end of last year is a follow on to GDPR. Um, I think that's also an opportunity. Um, how do both startups, large organizations, how do they deal with making sure they're complying with these regulations? So where there is new regulation, there's opportunity. And I think European startups could maybe lead the charge on compliance automation for helping organizations get comfortable that they are in fact complying with these new regulations and new laws that are, not, that are now on the books. Um, I would also say, if you look at the, the new European regulatory landscape, you know, it's, it's very clear on what are considered sensitive use cases, what are risky use cases, but it's not like the regulation says you shouldn't do those. There's a very clear playbook on how to do those in the right way. And that is then also backed up by government incentives to help fund those companies that decide to go into those sensitive use cases and are committed to doing those in the right way. And so that's another thing companies should be thinking about that they will get government support if they follow the rules, do sensitive use cases in the right way. There may be additional sources of funding uh, that they can tap into. Um, one other thing I would like to call out, having done now a handful of investments in Germany and Austria, I really think there is an opportunity for the digital transformation of the government bureaucracy that overlooks or oversees startup, you know, funding rounds, startup paperwork, you know, company incorporation. Frankly, this is a very, very painful experience. Uh, and for many US investors, this can be a bit of a shock. Um, I've had investors tell me that it takes more paperwork to do a $50,000 investment in Germany than it took to do uh, uh, you know, a round of hundreds of millions of dollars here in the US. Um, and that could be something that they would probably never ever want to go through again, given how painful the process was. If you think about the notarization process and how lengthy and antiquated that is, if you think about the powers of attorney and wet copies of that that are required anytime you change anything to the cap table. Um, if you think about just the back and forth and the amount of paperwork that goes into it, the, um, the audits that are required, the, the disclosures that are required, they are far in excess of what is happening here in the US. And I think it's doing a disservice to the community, it's doing a disservice to founders and to VCs and being able to be agile uh, and you know, close the gap with what's happening in the US. And I think that's also an opportunity. It will require a partnership uh, with investors with the government and also potentially an opportunity for innovation to help catalyze that digital transformation. And how do we make this entire process uh, of funding startups uh, in Europe much more streamlined than it currently is. Now, as far as you know, areas, you know, techn technology areas, I'll be very honest, I, I see very similar things happening in the US um, that we see happening in Europe. You certainly see centers of excellence in terms of academic institutions uh, from where the leading research labs are then, uh, you know, uh, the people in those labs are going off and starting companies, um, you know, certainly vertical AI and whether it's in healthcare or in automotive, uh, you know, industrial automation and manufacturing is maybe one area where Europe stands out a little bit more, given uh, the very strong, strong um, industrial manufacturing base, especially in Germany, but Europe more generally. Uh, but other than that, I don't see vast differences in terms of technology problems with AI that US companies um, are solving versus European. Just to you know, kind of put it out there, areas I'm excited about that I would love to see new European companies innovate in, um, certainly simulation platforms and AI infused simulation is one that I think is, is an exciting new trend. Um, being able to think about autonomous systems and autonomous agents and not just operating and acting on the physical world, 
But increasingly, if you think about the hype about the metaverse, but then you think about what's real and what's actually utilitarian, uh, thinking about digital twins, thinking about, you know, for example, NVIDIA's vision of the omniverse or the industrial metaverse and AI and autonomous systems acting in these virtual worlds. Um, thinking about synthetic data generation and creating platforms to generate synthetic data across all different kinds of use cases and truly as a platform versus you know, doing something very custom or professional services oriented, which is typically what we've seen from synthetic data plays to date. So these are the kinds of things that I would be very excited to see uh, more of in Europe. I would certainly expect more innovation in robotics and AI, uh, again, tying back to the, the strong uh, industrial manufacturing base that exists, uh, and especially in Germany. But overall, I think we have great universities um, uh, in continental Europe, in the UK, and from there, we're seeing you know, new innovations in almost the same areas that we see also coming out of uh, US academic institutions and in addition to the tech giants. Thank you very much, Samir. Uh, Rashmi, welcome to the panel. Thank you. It's really exciting to uh, speak with this amazing group of people here and really insightful pieces of um, perspectives that were shared by the other folks. For me personally, it's really exciting to see the rapid innovation that we're seeing out of Europe broadly, the DAC region, and Germany as well in AI and in the, uh, the newer market innovations across, I would say, the broader technology landscape. UK and Germany, definitely the top two within the European markets where we're seeing a lot of innovative technologies coming out of, uh, and that was also represented in the funding numbers that we have seen uh, continue to increase uh, over the last two to three years, over 8 billion funding going primarily even just to German tech startups, as well as I would say the emergence of really interesting startups across a variety of different sectors where in the past, I would say a lot of the innovation was specifically tied to robotics or autonomous driving. We're now seeing that expand into areas like um, Credit Watch providing, Credit Tech providing in the SMB and mid-market financing space uh, or Ada Health uh, on the personalized healthcare space, Gorillas and Last Mile Delivery, Salon as we talked about. So it's really very exciting to see a bunch of these highly valued uh, market category leaders emerging in other sectors beyond, I would say, the core expected sectors on the industrials and the manufacturing side. A couple of things that um, I wanted to call out in terms of uh, opportunities um, that, um, that the folks on this call should maybe think about. Uh, I would say the two key opportunities, uh, especially for, for startups and the regulatory frameworks in Europe, one would be around the access to talent. The best companies and the best technologies are primarily attributed to top talent and world-class talent that we, that we see in countries like US and China and other regions. And I think this is definitely an area of opportunity for the folks in the dark region, as well as I would say, especially in Germany, where if you look at the number of PhD students uh, in the field of AI, where I think the latest number for the folks in Germany was 170 compared to over 3,000 in the US. And so how do you create opportunities to attract uh, the best researchers and the best talent in that region is something to, to think about uh, that can provide, again, a significant uh, acceleration of innovation out of the region. The other thing as well is on the glaring lack of diversity in AI where um, I would say the percentage of the talent pool for females and minorities uh, in the DAC region, and I would say in regions like Switzerland and Germany are, I would say, below the average of other European countries. And so addressing the underrepresentation of female and diverse talent uh, in the AI community uh, would definitely be great to, to see more done around that. And then the last one I would say is around balancing the need between data privacy and protection and leveraging data sets to drive better outcomes. Uh, obviously this does not mean that uh, lower regulation, uh, but really around how do you better integrate this, these uh, diverse and disparate systems to get insights out of those, um, out of those platforms 
that can drive better outcomes, uh, both for the enterprise customers themselves, but also for the broader population. That's something that I know a lot of companies always keep in mind is the data data regulations in EU are a lot more stringent than those in other regions. And so how do you leverage technologies like maybe data encryption and data masking, synthetic data creation uh, across those AI platforms so that the data can be better integrated and leveraged uh, between the systems uh, while also balancing the need for, for privacy um, and data protection. Um, so I would say in general, there's a lot of excitement, enthusiasm in the venture community um, in, in funding uh, more companies out of Europe. The world is getting a lot more global. I would say the two years of the pandemic have brought us increasingly closer where deals can now be done over Zoom. You don't have to be uh, face to face in person. You don't necessarily need feet on the ground, which definitely opens up the the surplus of funding capital that we've seen over the last three to four years uh, being available to, to startups and companies in every corner of the world. So while that happens, I think the more visibility and awareness that companies in the transatlantic region can create for the investors in the US and other markets, I think that definitely is going to yield much better outcomes for, for all of us globally. Great, thank you. Rashmi, thank you very much. Two takeaways from my end. One is there was so much content, valuable content shared over the last 15 minutes by the VC community. I have to definitely revisit the video recording. And second of all, uh, I think the topic itself is worth a dedicated transatlantic AI exchange topic around VCs uh, in the upcoming months. So incredible um, value that was shared here. Thank you very much. Uh, Thomas, um, if I can just uh, add to that, uh, we shared some polls, uh, dur surveys during the last um, session, and uh, this is incredible. One in three people uh, attending this webinar right now are looking for investment for their company. So uh, good luck to everyone looking for investment. Uh, I will share something in the chat box uh, where you can see more information about the VC speakers and their VC firms. Uh, and also, in terms of location, uh, it's very diverse today. We have lots of people from Germany, lots of people uh, across Europe, but also people from India, I believe, and the United States and the United Kingdom. Um, it's really interesting to see this uh, sort of dynamic. And finally, in terms of attendee roles, this is very interesting as well. Uh, one quarter of people here are founders or CXOs, uh, but we also have a lot of uh, AI and technology scientists, academics, students, and um, there's a very big mix of uh, what companies uh, people come from in terms of size. So go ahead, Thomas, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Adam. That is uh, very interesting news you just shared. Uh, it even further justifies what this transatlantic platform is all about. So if you go on our website, there are previously nine sessions equal for one hour uh, deep dive conversations about startups and founding and transatlantic businesses. They're all recorded. So you can watch the videos for free. It also justifies further that we are going to do more startups tailored uh, sessions in the next few months. So I'm inviting everybody to participate uh, if they'd like to do so. Moving along, we are now into the next panel of this conversation. I would like to introduce our sponsors, uh, Intel. Uh, on one side, there is uh, Joe Curley, is the Vice President and General Manager at Intel Software Products and Ecosystem. There will be Zach Weisfeld, he is the Vice President and General Manager for Ignite, the Intel for Startups initiative that we have uh, pulled off a few years ago and we are going global now. That one is going to be a recording. He had a conflict, but he didn't want to miss to uh, get his message across. And then last but not least, we also invited one of the Intel Ignite uh, participants, a startup company out of Germany. And uh, I would like to introduce Tristan Rolliard, also he's the co-founder of Hasty. With that in mind, Joe, welcome this morning to the panel. Well, thanks so much, Thomas. And thanks to everyone at the Transatlantic AI Exchange. It's a pleasure to get a chance to be here and join the forum <clears throat> and to listen to so many of the speakers, some of my themes 
Well, I'll be talking about technology, actually talk very much about some of the global economic and social aspects that have already been uncovered. One of the, one of the problem statements that I work on every day is as we look at the, you know, the kind of the explosion of data where there are, you can look at different data sources, but if you think there may be 200 zettabytes of data stored in the cloud, with, cloud within a couple of years, the underlying compute that's necessary to be able to digest that, to gain intelligence from it, to, to take the innovations you're building and turn them into value um, is growing at a geometric rate. And there's, there's a, a, a problem that comes with it. It's the power for which we're going to actually power that compute is growing, it's, well, very slowly, or it's almost only flat, which is leading to uh, an idea of acceleration. And th there were some comments about a conference going on today uh, from uh, another company talking about all of the innovations that they're doing uh, for, for AI and other topics. Um, the, the bottom line is, is that new technological architectures are going to have to blossom in order to be able to handle this data explosion. There's a wonderful paper from Hennessy Patterson done a couple of years ago that describes it as the Cambrian explosion of novel compute architectures. Pretty exciting times in terms of innovation, especially if you're starting up your business and you're, you're, you're looking at how Europe can grow the semiconductor industry and what types of products will serve the, the AI explosion. There's a problem with this though, which is how the devil does anybody ever program one of these things? One of the things we hear all the time, I was just speaking to some scientists at CERN, is these novel architectures are lovely, but I have to rewrite my code and take years in order to be able to utilize one of them. And once I've done that, I'm stuck because the, the the problem I run into is, is that the, the three or four year investment minimum in order to handle one physics application grinds science to a halt. So how do you deal with a time of great change and a time of great novel uh, innovation, geographic and ge expansion, ecosystem expansion, but then be able to get any kind of scale for the, the startup that you're doing around AI? Ultimately, there are things like middleware. We, you know, we can hope that uh, uh, your, your, your application will be a TensorFlow or your version of uh, whichever middleware, middleware you're doing for whichever, uh, how you're implementing AI uh, will take care of some of that abstraction for you. But even then, we still have the problem that underlying that, who, what are you programming the middleware in? And there's a lot of stickiness to individual pieces of hardware, Intel's and others in the marketplace today that limits choice and limits flexibility. And so at one level, this is a problem that if you, if you own that, if you've got a great install base, it's not really a problem, one might think, except it is a diverse ecosystem. I think there were some comments earlier in the very first talks that, we, that competition's good and that having, uh, having a diverse ecosystem in which we can all play actually sparks innovation. And actually, Intel's a huge believer in that. And that's really what I'm trying to do and what my mission in life is um, at, at, at Intel. At some point, industries grow up, accelerations coming into the marketplace and just getting started. We want to create novel standards that, that enable people to develop for the hardware that you want. We call this One API. Um, when we announced the One API, it's a, it, was, it was a bold step, a multi-standard, multi-vendor architecture with languages, libraries, and standard bindings and interfaces that allow developers, wherever you are, to choose what hardware you want to use rather than having your hardware choose it for you. I'd like to spend a lot of time talking about it, but I noticed that I'm almost out of my own talk time. I'll simply say that since we've been able to bring One API to market, we have seen it be used successfully on CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, ASICs from companies in Europe, in China, in America, the Intel exhibited on AMD, NVIDIA, Xilinx, and many other vendors. True cross-platform compute uh, uh, standards for AI. If this is at all interesting to you, if what you want to do is increase the serviceable and addressable market, when you make, when you're in your startup, when you're at your phases, you're going to make some critical choices, uh, either for open and extensible languages or for expediency. Uh, we'd encourage you to take a look at open and extensible. And if you're interested in more on that, uh, take a look at uh, oneapi.io for our open source repositories or specifications or uh, intel.com, software.intel.com to actually uh, try out our tools and what, where we are today in the process. And if I, it sparked an interest in very, very limited time, or you could even just DM me at uh, Jay, look Jake Curley up on uh, Twitter and um, I'm happy to talk to you more about what we're trying to do. Now, when, let's move from the idea of a product that opens up ecosystem to uh, ways to help evolve your, your startup. And uh, I think my comrade Zach will come in and tell us about in just a moment. Thanks, Joe.
So have you heard? We're all about openness and acceleration, time, performance, and revenues, which I'm sure that most of you are going to subscribe to. My name is Zach Weisfeld, and run, I run Intel Ignite. Intel Ignite it's, is Intel's early state startup program. It's an acceleration program, and it operates currently out of two locations, Tel Aviv, Israel, and Munich is our European headquarters. And soon we're going to open our Boston location as well as our London location. So at Ignite, we're taking groundbreaking startups and we help them be even more successful faster. Uh, we have a pretty rigorous selection process, about three months of, of a selection process for each batch. Um, and it, we accept only about 4% of the companies that apply. It's a 12 week, very intense program. It's a high touch program where we open up all of our access to markets, experts, mentors, uh, technologists, for startups that are trying to, to break through their specific uh, uh, area of expertise or IP. And our portfolio has grown more than 400% in these past couple of years that we exist. Lately, we also grabbed the number one spot of, of the top startup accelerator program in Tel Aviv, which is a very um, a competitive market. Uh, we're gonna board it by Geek Time, which is the leading uh, tech blog of, of Israel. So it may surprise some of you that we take companies uh, that not only are hardware, semiconductor, um, or silicon companies, we take a lot of companies in the AI space. So actually more than 60% of the startups that, that get accepted to Ignite are either developing platforms for AI or are leveraging AI for, for their needs, for what they're developing to the world. So they're using the AI to solve real, real world problems, right? Building um, a variety of solutions out there. Uh, so we're seeing massive of usage and deployment of computer vision, NLP, neural networks. And we believe that AI is a great opportunity for startups to leapfrog current incumbents. And also what we see is that AI fuels a lot of the funding rounds that are happening right now and the valuations, which are the, which are the highest ever in, in the startup world. So what are we looking for? We're looking for startups that have great technology. So they have real IP, their technology, uh, very strong teams. We like pretty balanced teams. We're looking for startups that raised more than, a, more than $1 million. We don't want you to starve while you we're working with you on, a, on, your, on the product market fit of your, your solution, as well, as well as we're looking for teams that are willing to learn because we're a very mentor heavy program. We bring a lot of people to help you learn about the markets you're in and, and help guide you through that journey. So you need to be open to, to learn from that. Um, and if you want to learn more and hear more about, uh, about Ignite and about how Intel can help you as a startup, more than welcome to go to intelignite.com and learn more about us, about the portfolio of companies. So you can probably see a lot of companies in similar spaces that you're at and also how to apply. We're currently in the process of accepting companies to our batch six in Tel Aviv and our batch three in, in Munich, in, in Europe. So if you're a European startup, I think there was, there's not better time in history to be successful, leverage a company like Intel in making you more successful. So join us and, and apply to Intel Ignite and let us help you be successful. We wanna co-create great technology future together with, with groundbreaking startups. So thank you very, very much, Thomas, for having me here and we'll be more than happy to answer any of the questions you have. Thank you. Great, thank you. And right over to Tristan, who was actually participating in, in one of the uh, Ignite batches. Tristan, why don't you share your viewpoint with the audience, please? Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, yeah, to, to start with Rehasty.ai, it's one of these platform AI startups that Andreas was referring to in his speech earlier. If we start with the premise that today companies are defined or well, their competition is defined by the need that they address as opposed to the sector they traditionally came from, the need for such companies to add value-added services to their products to differentiate them is ever increasing. With that in mind, Hasty um, works together with agriculture, construction, logistics, and medical startups to add Vision AI to their products and services and make it faster and easier for them to do this reliably. We work together with Intel with the, the, the Ignite program because 
it's quite clear where Hasty and Intel are ecosystem players and complementary players. Intel provides the compute power and the install base that AI runs on top of. And we sit very nicely on top of some of this middleware that Joe was referring to in his speech, um, OpenVINO specifically in this case. So we sit uh, uh, very nicely and neatly on top of OpenVINO to help companies train those AIs more reliably and faster and to implement them. So to, to open up the use case for companies that, that, that are looking to do that. The Ignite program's got two major components to it. It's mentorship from internal and external mentors at Intel. Uh, for us, this was wonderful. It really provided four to five concrete opportunities through various departments, one of them being Joe's department, and we're very excited about that. Uh, the second part that we did was an exchange between uh, experienced founders that spoke on relevant topics throughout the program. So the, the weeks are themed. And they get fantastic uh, founders to speak to us about these themes uh, throughout. Uh, so the learning from those experienced founders from their actual journeys, as well as from founders from our cohort, uh, from our batch peers, we had incredible learnings from. So our takeaway is we did change the way we ran our company as a result of the Intel Ignite program. We had very concrete takeaways from it. They totally delivered on the ask in the beginning. They asked us what we we're looking from the program. It was delivered in terms of real concrete opportunities of what we can do together with Intel. We have four or five of those. And I would say they over-delivered on aspects we didn't anticipate. I'm generally rather skeptical of such programs. I was not Expecting much going in with starting the conversations when I met the team that was running the Ignite program, Alois and, and uh, Kate. And the more I spoke to them, the more excited I got about it. And as we did the program, throughout the program, I, got, I enjoyed it more and more. And so I com completely would recommend it, have recommended uh, four startups to go in. So if you do your net promoter score, I would say relatively high from that perspective. So for us, it was fantastic. So thank you, Thomas. Over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining this, this panel section. Greatly appreciate it and good luck to you. Thanks. One last thing. I, I'm actually in San Francisco at the moment, although we are Berlin based. So if anyone, I see there's a large US contingent here. If anyone wants to meet up for a coffee and a beer, happy to do so. Aren't we living in the virtual world? This is amazing. So having said that, the next panel discussion, I'm really excited to introduce the moderator who will walk us through the next uh, panel discussions with some really, really incredible seasoned C startup CEOs who have in itself an incredible track record. And they will talk about value creation and how do you know you have the right idea. With that in mind, I would, uh, I'm honored to actually introduce Mark Hawkins he is the former president and CEO of our emeritus of Salesforce, has an incredible history with Autodesk and Dell and Logitech and many, many others, including a serial board members of cool companies. So with that, Mark, uh, happy that you are able to join us and take it from here. Thank you for the kind introduction. I always wanted to say uh, live from New York, I'm uh, on Wall Street uh, addressing a number of different things. Uh, but I didn't want to miss this. Uh, Thomas has done such an amazing job with this forum, and it's honored to be uh, just part of this whole dialogue, which is really shaping all of our future with an incredible list of entrepreneurs. We're really uh, doing startups and scale ups, and, and that's something I've spent 40 years doing. And so uh, truly an honor. And, you know, each of the, uh, uh, the panel will have a chance to introduce themselves, but it's a, it's a distinguished uh, panel. So I'm just honored to do that. You know, I was thinking, Thomas, about, you know, you know, the real criticality of this dialogue we're going to have. And it's really around, you know, how do we really think about starting up and scaling up and how do we stay focused? And one thing that I've really learned, you know, and Mark Benioff likes to say it all the time from Salesforce, if everything's important, nothing's important. And that's something that, you know, has to be a founder's mindset. And I can say I've worked with some very distinguished founders. I've had the great, you know, pleasure, as Thomas said, to work with Hewlett and Packard, uh, Daniel Burrell, Logitech, Michael Dell, who I'm still on his board at uh, SecureWorks, Mark Benoff. Uh, it's been quite a, quite a journey, not to mention the, the newer uh, startups that we're dealing with, but staying focused and staying prioritized on what creates value. You know, I think it's so interesting with AI, it's like an instant success, right? It took 50 years to get here, to get through the hype cycle, and now there's all kinds of use cycles. And when you hit into use cycle, where you can solve a specific problem, 
a need that's unmet in the world and you pursue it with just a tremendous tenacity, the ideas become bankable and the ideas become actionable. And the ideas become super exciting to go ahead and, and start up and scale up. So that's what we're here today to talk about. I uh, couldn't be more honored to do that with the group of, of folks here. My last comment before I turn it right over is that when we're focused, the North Star for me has always been values. Values drive value. And they've been the North Star for us. Customer success, trust, innovation, doing something in quality doing something better than anybody else in the world has done it and solving a problem will bear beautiful fruit and will be a great journey. It won't be easy. It'll be bumps along the way, but what a journey it'll be. And on that note, let's go, let's go right into the, uh, the discussion. We have so many good people to talk about that proven entrepreneurs who are really making a great project, uh, uh, progress rather. And uh, Suryak, why don't you start out with your thoughts and we'll, we'll go from there. Hey, thank you, Mark. I think I, I want to latch on to what you just said about Mark Benioff and his story, because the question really is when you're an entrepreneur and you start out, you try to develop an idea and, you know, you try to be as rigorous as you can. And then you got this list and you're staring at it. You've got this five, list of five ideas. You maybe you whittle it down to three, then to two, then to one. And then you stare at that one idea and you wonder, not only are you in love with it, but at the same time, you wonder how you're going to sell it. And then maybe, you know, every now and then you start doubting yourself. Is this idea really, is it worth it? Am I going to bet my next five, 10 years on this? Yes or no? And that's what we're trying to address here today. So in other words, the question is, is it another Salesforce level idea or is it not? Let me give you a couple of thoughts on this to kick this off. Um, and I'll tell you what I do. Perhaps uh, that's helpful uh, when I try to analyze whether it's worth jumping into something or not. The first question I ask myself when I look at the idea is um, that I try to forget it as fast as I can. And only those ideas that I still can't forget with, even though I tried might be potentially interesting. And that already kills about 95 out of 100. I'm pretty good at forgetting stuff. So then the next question is how big is this market? And you might argue, well, it's a new idea. How can it have a market? Well, it always plays in something. Even though there were no social networks, there was an advertising market. So the question is, is this a greater $10 billion total addressable, addressable market? Some people might say 10 billion is a little high. You know, isn't a billion enough? If I have a billion dollars in revenue, I'm great. Well, that's true, but you won't get the entire market. So 10 billion is kind of a minimum for me to, to uh, find it interesting. The next question is much more important. And that is, Many ideas are good, very few are outstanding. And that is the biggest trap of all. Because now you're staring at your idea and you find a lot of good reasons why this thing is good. You know, there, there has to be a, a way to lift up a car. There has to be a better keychain. There has to be a, a, a better remote control. All of that is true. But is that really a great idea or is that a good idea? And I'll tell you what. The problem is when you look for money and when you look for customers, the only thing they're going to jump on are the outstanding ideas. And the other ones get buried in the sea of good ideas. So how do you do this? Compared to the potential of the web, online shopping, CRISPR technology, heck, even the light bulb. So how do you do that when something is a totally new idea? How can you find out if it has that potential? Imagine what would be possible if it did work. For example, imagine there were no, there, somebody had the idea to say, what if driving a car had zero impact on the environment? And here we are gas guzzling away, right? 30 years ago. And then somebody said, well, what if it could be electric? Well, that doesn't, that's not sufficient because that just means we produce energy in a different way, somewhere in a coal, coal plant. Um, but what if we charged it by solar? Okay, well, that's great. Now it's better, but we still are you know, using very dangerous uh, materials for the environment. So what if we made it of recycled materials, of use reusable materials? What if there was a biodegradable car? So now you're thinking in a completely different scale. Uh, think about chronic disease as an example, like diabetes. What if it turned into a movement to change lifestyles rather than a duty or some chore? 
What if it became cool? Or cancer, what if cancer revealed itself instead of searching for it and then automatically self-destructed? So in other words, when you, when you have an idea for a new technology or a new concept, think about what would happen if it did work. The next question is, well, what, would be, what would not happen if it didn't work? Imagine the world existed with your idea and then you took it away. Again, imagine a world where your idea is omnipresent and everybody uses it, and then you took it away. How big a letdown will that be for people? That to me is one of the most important tests of all. Imagine a world with your idea omnipresent and then take it away and look at the impact. And then lastly, why now? What is the delta? What's the change? What's the technological change, the societal change, the regulatory change that you're banking on, that you're jumping on? And then what are your moats, short-term and long-term? How do you defend yourself against competitors? Short-term, you might say, oh, I got a patent or I got a deal with a big player. Well, that's great. That's a short-term advantage. That's good. It's called an unfair advantage. It's not a long-term sustainable advantage. The next one, the long-term ones are much more important, which is increasing returns dynamics where more people join, the better it gets, for example. Not everything is built that way. Another way could be a brand, a really powerful brand that you're building. A third one could be some very deep technology that's extremely hard to copy over time because you keep iterating on it while others are just trying to catch up. And the final question is why you? Why should you do that thing? Why are you going to make it a better idea? Just because it's a great idea or even an outstanding idea, doesn't mean it should be realized by you. What can you do better than what anybody else can do? So I'll, I'll stop here and I hand it back to Mark. Well, thank you very much, uh, Syriac, for you know, some very inspiring and thoughtful uh, commentary. I'll address a few things at the end, but uh, really uh, spot on. So I'd like to turn it right over uh, to Alexander uh, for a few minutes here to, to give uh, his thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, thank you for all of you having me here, like in this, this, uh, this uh, cool session and, and conference, and also this particular panel, which also includes friends uh, who are also like uh, like sharing their thoughts. So I'm really happy about being being part of it. Now, um, from uh, some of you who know me, I'm currently working on my fourth company. Three prior to that, eventually I built up and, and sold like to large corporations. Uh, so I was I was young and needed the money. Yet all the ideas that emerged, like it became these companies companies that eventually got acquired, uh, I stumbled onto, right? It was not like a, some type of systematic behind it. It was like really just figuring out that there was something relevant, important. And I just started like doing it. And in the few cases prior, prior to my company now, I didn't even have to do anything like with venture capital, right? It was like, like get the idea running. And, and if you need money, go to the bank and convince the bank and get a loan. But you can only do that if you have revenue. So somehow like everything was really like pushed towards like the doubt to, towards the correct road. When I finally in, in 2014, I was out of my last earnout. I was really thinking about doing it differently. I wanted to go with a methodological approach, like a systematic approach, like to, like to find like the, the, the right idea to, to pursue. And um, I had the luck that prior to that, I was in Stanford, uh, both at GSB as well as at D school. And they taught me about design thinking and I learned a lot of great methodologies and about culture and strategy and how to put everything together into something that is remarkable. So I came up with a, with a prioritization matrix like for myself, so that every time I stumble upon an idea, I have really this large model that I go through and try to figure out like how do these reflect like in the different categories and the different vectors that are important like for making an idea successful. And so uh, it is not just about the potential for revenue, like the total addressable market or the earnings, but also what well, it's easy to explain. So can I explain the idea um, between two subway stops to a total stranger or the visibility? So can future non-users observe the users of that idea of that new uh, concept. Put it differently, uh, is it a Tesla that everybody sees when you buy it or is it like a herpes cream that nobody wants to talk about, right? Like, so uh, those kind of things are also like involved like in this complete self conversation that I have when I, when I try to understand like whether an idea is good or not. 
um, but it's also like aspects like whether do I do I really control the resources that are necessary in order to implement at least like the first or the second stage of such an idea because otherwise I really quickly get to a point where I maybe have a great idea but I'm simply incapable of of getting it up and running and I might lose time on that and then of course which is like one of the most important aspects, I think like in the complete heuristic and it's really like a very complex form. It's like, it takes me 20 minutes like to write down every every idea and it comes up with a score to tell me like where to put my attention to, which type of idea should, so to say, get like my full focus. Um, but one in, in, this, in, this, in this heuristic, there's like one uh, most important part I would refer to, which is like whether an idea goes along with my values and whether it will make me happy on the long run to pursue like this idea, knowing that the long-term idea of making it successful and maybe eventually exiting it will only be at the very end, like of the, or maybe like even at the middle, like of the complete journey. But during the journey, I will have to face a lot of, a lot of constraints, a lot of pushbacks, a lot of, lot of things that will have to cope with negative things as well. Um, and will the idea uh, provide me with enough motivation and with enough uh, strength, like really to sustain uh, through these uh, through these uh, um, hard times that every entrepreneur knows about and everybody who wants to become an entrepreneur should totally be aware about there will be these times. Now, um, kind of interesting, like I entered in 2014, like particularly with this concept, with this model, uh, I went to South by Southwest in Austin, like to find like my next new idea and was was unfortunately the witness like of, a, of, a, of an accident where, where uh, many people died. And the only reason for that happening was uh, that information that was actually available, like in sensors, in, 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 in the police, in the, in the smart cities, control rooms, and even like on the smartphones of the people who were who are observing that, uh, was not brought like into one common place. So um, at the very end, with all of these heuristics, I stumbled effectively like on the, on, the, on, the, on the core idea that formed like my today's company, Ava, which is all about being a little bit, you know, like the weather forecast, but not for wind, rain, and sun, but for crime, terror, natural disasters, every type of critical incidents and risks. Only later, I took this idea like through my great heuristic. And again, like it ended up very, very, uh, very, very high because uh, it drives like also like this, this powerful force of keeping me motivated, like in the people that work with me on this idea. But this more or less like gives a, gives a rough idea like on, on, on how I try to, uh, come to the right idea so there is like a methodology in a system but at the very end it, it are really like these moments that, that that capture one's attention and say like okay there is really a problem that needs to be solved and it has to be solved regardless of whether it's a regardless of the details of the idea so there is really like a push uh to to drive something forward tremendous uh, tremendous input and inspiration there um uh, alexander that that and, and just where you spur that idea is just terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe this is a good time uh, to turn it over to Ted to also share some inspiration. Appreciate you having me, Mark. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, I have to rewind a little bit in my head. Uh, so I was employee 27 at Data Robot, where it's like 1,600 people. So our journey has been long and it's exciting to scale, but it's a little different, I think, than the two founders we, we heard from previously. Um, rewinding in my head to when I was like a budding data scientist. Uh, for me, I was usually, uh, in all honesty, I was gambling on basketball using machine learning. And I had spent six months crafting an algorithm, trying to identify win probabilities for, for teams. And over lunch, through a friend of a friend, I talked to the, the founder of Data Robot, and he said, hey, we're looking for new data sets. Why don't you come by the office? And so I did. I went to the office. It's above a really at the time, a really crummy bar in Boston. We had no customers. Uh, they had no customers at that point. And, and he said, hey, let's have the data. Puts it in. About 30 minutes later, I'll never forget it, an algorithm called the Nyastream Kernel SVM1. And I remember thinking, I spent six months of my life trying to have an optimized algorithm here. And an algorithm in this platform was identified in 20, 30 minutes. And I had never even heard of that type of, of algorithm, that, that specific type of SVM. And I said, well, there's got to be something here. So fast forward a couple of weeks, I then become the director of customer success when we had no customers, right? So I'm involved in all these conversations. And for me, what it came down to is what is the value proposition? And for me, recognizing the value meant seeing some, uh, experiencing some pain that had to be overcome, understanding the, the hardships of a data scientist uh, and those types of and that kind of prior knowledge 
led me to recognize the value in data robot, which, like I said, it was very early days, but not quite the perspective of these founders who, uh, you know, have very inspirational, good, reflective questions. They were already on a journey, but for me as an early employee, when do you take that gamble at a company who has a Series A? So for me, it was relatively easy because I wanted to have the best gambling algorithm, but that side hustle, that knowledge led me through all that pain uh, and understanding of a use case. And then of course, when you start as an early employee, you wear many hats. So you very quickly understand your go-to-market strategy, what messaging works, you're calling up friends saying, hey, can we just get a demo of our product in front of people and so on? So you very, it's never linear, right? Like I'm sure all these VC partners are saying, oh, I, all I see is hockey sticks, right? Uh, but our journey kind of bounce, bounces around that hockey stick. You want that same trajectory, but it's never quite exactly as you expect. Um, so that's how I recognize value, if I'm being honest. <laughs> well, that's a, that's, that's a lot of a great input and also just your point of, taking a passion, applying technology use cases and, and getting creative. And I think, uh, again, very inspiring, Ted. Uh, let's uh, have Cindy weigh in here. I'd love to hear her points uh, and inspiration. Thanks, Mark. Um, greetings from Copenhagen. Usually I'm in New York, but I'm in Copenhagen today. Uh, and uh, this is, I love this topic because value creation is, is something uh, that really resonates with me. There's a lot of friends on the screen here and, and it's great to see you all uh, here. And how do you know if you have the right idea? Well, um, there are a couple of verticals that I think of, and it's almost from an investor standpoint and lens uh, that I look into when I think about what should be built or what ideas are really interesting. Most of the things that I look into have a data element to it. Um, so, you know, data is, is uh, very key and pivotal. We're only going to move forward and more towards regenerating so much, so many terabytes into uh, unreal territories now. So with data, that's like the first element. The second is uh, what are universal, simple ideas that tend to uh, be a problem for a lot of people, regardless of their geographics or regardless of their, um, you know, even occupation, so to speak. And one of them, actually in 2014, Alex, one of the first people that Alex told his idea about Ava and public safety. And I said immediately, yes, right, immediately. It's a universal problem. It's subjective, depending on which part of the world you're in, depending on uh, how old you are, et cetera. And it's a problem that needs to be solved, especially for women, right? We're talking about a lot about diversity and that what that play is. There's not enough solutions out there uh, when, it, when it comes to other things. So when he said that immediately, I said, yes, you know, came on board as an advisor, invest, now investing in it. Um, as well. And so these kind of ideas, these trends already existed prior before the problems, or excuse me, the problems existed prior before the ideas happened, right? And so, you know, what are those trends, again, that go there? So safety was one. Uh, another is, you know, typically um, time. So with Clipper in March of 2020, which I hope, um, Adam, you and Thomas will put these, these sessions on the Clipper so it can uh, give some value to all the attendees who weren't able to see it or wanted to go back and see it, um, is a video um, AI solution for, you know, to save time. So not everybody can spend five, six hours on a European AI conference, but if they want to catch up on it, Clipper does that for you um, with our, you know, machine learning algorithms and our AI algorithms so that you can focus on the moments that matter, which is what I would say here. Um, and, you know, so time, safety, and then uh, other verticals that really kind of, I look at where does it exist that it can make a whole market, right? If, if there's a lot of ideas that are looking for a problem to solve, those are not going to be the best ideas. You know, you have to find a problem that needs to be solved, and then you build that idea. I think because otherwise, um, I, if I've spoken to thousands of startup founders that you know who've come to me for advice or even in these speed dating sessions at these conferences, um, and, and it's very hard. You know, there's so many problems out there, but it's very hard to find an addressable market that's relevant to. Uh, wait, worth spending time, as Sarah mentioned in his in his comments. You know, spending the time out there. So, you know, don't always look at creating a market. It's it's very difficult to do unless you have you know a significant amount of investment and a lot of investors who believe in you in order to make that forward. But for that case, you know, that's something else. And then lastly, um, looking deep in the markets out there is where does talent pool exist? Right. Um, I always think 
I, I don't hesitate in looking at P and developers' GitHubs and seeing where all the developers go because if they're excited out there, you're gonna have the best engineering talent out there. So, um, you know, and and there's gonna be more attraction. There's more community. There's more people talking about it, more excitement, et cetera, because something cool is happening, right? You can just see the energy because it's in the Discord, it's on Twitter, or it's in, you know, Snapchat, whatever it is that you use. LinkedIn, you know, and all that. I think everybody can see this from LinkedIn. So those are kind of the areas where I look at in, in terms of value creation and what makes a great idea uh, and what's worth the time on it. And um, hopefully, you know, you can create a stronger relationship with your customers or a stronger relationship with your community um, and build from there and, uh, and, that, and leverage on that. So that's all I had to say. Thank you. Uh, Cindy, thank you for that. Tons of great ideas from every one of you, you know, you, you and Ted and Alexander and uh, just uh, Syriac and uh, just, you know, the whole dialogue has been inspiring. Just a couple quick takeaways. I'm going to turn it over to Thomas because I know time is tight. I took a note to, to synthesize. Don't be afraid to be scrappy and, and pivot when you're learning and trying to find these answers to the right thing. Uh, just a quick uh, notion that might surprise you. HP started out in the oscilloscopes business, ended up in the computer business. Dell started out in computer services, ended up being the hardware supplier of the world. Uh, Logitech ended up trying to do software, ended up discovering a mouse. Don't be afraid as you've innovated to pivot and learn and integrate. Um, as Mahatma Gandhi once said, the truth is as it's revealed to you today, keep evolving. Uh, we heard about the importance of TAM and uh, looking for unfortified hills, better ideas. I would throw out for your consideration, be a student of patterns of success. I love Alexander's grid. We all need to have patterns of success and replicate and learn and be disciplined in that way. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, we always uh, have to uh, think about the data that Cindy talked about. The collision of data and intuition is magical. And I just think that uh, we should know that. And then lastly, I'll leave you one thing I've observed from some amazing founders is if you have a pathway and no vision, you have a lot of wheel spinning. If you have a vision and no pathway, you have a lot of frustration. If you have a pathway and a vision, you change the world. I'll leave you on that note as you start up and scale up. I'm going to back to you. Wow. Incredible. Thank you very much. A little bit behind schedule, but this is so amazing. And I hope that everybody in this audience here took as much information out of this conversation as I just did. So everybody, thank you very much. To the next panel, we are now looking a little bit differently into another sector of the startup ecosystem, which are the incubation, the incubators. I would like to introduce Benjamin Joffe, is the partner at SOSV in Paris. And we also have Rasmus Rote here, uh, the founder of Merantix uh, out of Berlin. With that, Benjamin, please uh, go ahead, take it over from here. Thanks, Thomas, for having me. And uh, yeah, so it was uh, really interesting to hear like uh, what all the previous speakers had to say about uh, building teams on the looking for opportunities and uh, for us it's particularly relevant because um, so SOSV is a very large uh, fund today it has a uh, 1.2 billion US dollars under management uh, but we invest uh, pretty much first checks into all the or new companies every year we invest in over 100 startups particularly in uh, what's called uh, deep tech uh, in uh, hardware and biology and we run programs to support uh, generally the first uh, few founders and their prototype to uh, build it into a more advanced or commercial uh, product and uh, turn what's a science project into uh, a company. And um, the typical investment uh, for this is a quarter million dollars to a half million dollars. And then we follow on, and that's where we probably differ from most uh, accelerators uh, in that uh, we can invest at later stages up to $5 million uh, for, for each company. Um, so um, now to the topic of AI, what, what I found is that uh, even though our focuses are hardware and biology, and particularly things uh, around health or climate tech, um, we actually have a very big uh, event coming up in a few months called the Climate Tech Summit. So I'll maybe sharing the link uh, for everybody later, uh, is that we found that many companies today uh, have AI in some form uh, in their product. So software is the brain, uh, but then you'll need also to build the body with labs and experts uh, that we uh, help them with. Uh, we have labs in San Francisco, in New York, in Shenzhen as well. 
uh, that help accelerate the product development. So um, in a way, uh, what we found is that uh, AI can help, uh, in some cases, uh, design new products, uh, for example, with things like computational biology, in our biology program. Uh, we found that uh, AI in the form of machine learning can be used to treat, uh, of course, uh, data like uh, uh, images um, or even sound. Uh, one of our companies uh, based in Sweden uh, called uh, Minute uh, has uh, released a product that analyzes this, the sound in your home um, so that uh, it can help uh, particularly Airbnb hosts and or short-term renters uh, to avoid uh, noise and nuisance uh, in addition to tracking things like humidity and temperature. And they do a lot of uh, signal processing and the machine learning actually to, to identify not just the sound level, but to recognize sound events. Um, and uh, so that's a, the product so popular that actually Airbnb is recommending it now to their hosts. Um, so those are just some examples of uh, how um, AI is now for many domains actually table stakes. Uh, we found that in some of our industrial companies that uh, deal with uh, uh, like heavy machinery in factories, uh, data analysis and uh, with um, to, to do things like um, predictive maintenance uh, is also involving uh, some aspects of AI. So generally, um, in terms of support we give, we don't really help the companies with the core of the technology, which is the software, but we help them uh, with the implementation through the hardware or through the biology. And for that, we have labs and experts on access to supply chains that can help do all of that. So uh, more or less, I think that's it for me. Um, um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer on the, the chat or on the Discord uh, channel. Uh, we're happy to have uh, any founder apply to our programs. We fund 100 companies a year uh, from all around the world, and uh, uh, we're looking forward to uh, new projects. Thank you, Benjamin. Appreciate it, and greetings to beautiful Paris. Uh, Rasmus, please uh, welcome to the team, to the panel discussion, and uh, welcome you from, I assume, you're in Berlin at the moment. Yes, exactly. Thomas, super fun conference so far, and super excited to be here and Ben, great points you mentioned before. I'm Rasmus, I'm one of the co-founders of Merantix. We are a venture studio building AI first companies. So we actually work with founders, ideate with them. And then when we have enough conviction, spin off a company and put up to around 3 million euros behind the company. We've started six companies so far in very different industries. And so as we also plan to start even more companies in the upcoming years, um, it's always very important for us to look out for new trends around AI spaces we are excited about. And I wanted to share some of them with you. So on the technological side, there's actually three things we're very excited about. So the first one is building more companies around natural language processing. Um, I mean, just thinking about like how much time humans spend on writing and reading text, you know, it's, it's immense. And so there's a lot of potential for automation uh, there. And we will see the next wave of companies there. Um, secondly, um, generative models. So we've seen a lot of AI models that are very good at understanding data, but we see, see more and more models that are also actually good at generating uh, data, whether it's video, text, but also could also be biological data. Um, and then multimodality is another area we're very excited about. That's the third one. So um, as humans, we are also looking not just, you know, at, at images or we're sensing stuff or we're smelling stuff. We, we look do all of that at the same time and we'll see a similar trend around AI models that will basically take in different data sources and thus can do much better predictions. Now, from an industrial, from an industry perspective, we're still very excited about pharma, healthcare, and biotech. We've started already two companies there. We want to do more there at the intersection. And that's similar to what also Ben said of these sciences and, and healthcare more broadly uh, with, with machine learning data is there's still so much to do. Um, we're also very excited about manufacturing, anything shop floor related, you know, whether it's robotics, predictive maintenance, quality control, operational efficiency, using AI on the shop floor. Uh, and then lastly, um, the whole space of cybersecurity, also from a European angle, um, there's you know, big demand for cyber experts. So there's a lot of big potential for automation also um, and need also, um, um, but also obviously uh, as the techs become more complex, you know, if you think about the human vector, um, there's more potential for, you, for, for, for using AI there. Structurally, um, we, we see a big trend around sustainability, both making AI models more sustainable, but also um, using AI to make the world more sustainable and, and fighting some of the challenges. Um, we, we monitor the EU regulation quite closely. Um, and then I think one area where we see quite some bottlenecks is on the hardware side as models become larger. So with the German AI Association really pushing large European AI models, the Liam initiative uh, to make sure we have uh, yeah, also larger hardware here in Europe. Now, as a studio, last year we had around a thousand founders applying uh, to found a company with us uh, and we work only with a few. So um, there's 
quite some process when we work with the founders. Generally, we look at two things. So on the founder side, um, like the most important question is really, um, do we believe, um, can this person attract like, the best talent in the world? Uh, would I work for this person myself? Um, and does the person deeply care about the problem we want to solve? Because um, you know the, the journey, as we heard earlier, is it's very hard as a founder. There's a lot of up and down. So only if you really care about the problem, um, you will you will push through and go all the way. And then lastly, we want to see a founder an idea fit. Just also because uh, otherwise, for some of these domains, it's just very hard. Um, and then on the idea, oh, I think we look mostly at two or time horizons. On the one hand, uh, we look at it very short term, like what is the go to market? What is the customer? Uh, what is the initial customer? What is the exact pain point? So really having our founders spend time out in the market and, and really evaluating that and, and being very, very close to the real problem. And if there's no pain point, then there's also a no company. And the other part is kind of looking very much at the long-term vision. Is there like a long-term trend? Uh, long Is the market long-term? Is it very big? Um, and is there something we fundamentally think is true um, and will also not change as we go on the journey? And so, yeah, if you're interested in, in AI, um, in Venture Studios in, in Berlin, Feel free to reach out to me uh, after this. I'm super excited for the next talks. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, both of you, for uh, good feedback. Now let's move to the next panel. Um, and obviously, particularly from a Europe perspective, in my opinion, privacy and ethics, uh, particularly around AI, is a very, very important topic that needs to be discussed. Um, it, it, there's concerns there, no doubt about it, but it also obviously creates opportunities for startup companies um, to you know, build the solution if the problem has been identified, which what a lot of people here have already uh, talked about. So with that in mind, I would like to introduce Olaf Groth. He is the CEO of Cambrian Futures. He's also uh, lecturing at the uh, Halt International Business School, as well as the University of uh, Berkeley Haas. And I'd also like to introduce Manuela Mackert. Uh, she's in Germany. Uh, Olaf is here in Berkeley in the Bay Area. And Manuela is the former chief compliance officer of Deutsche Telekom to talk about the privacy and ethical topics. Olaf, please take it from here. Many thanks, Thomas. Um, and hello, Manuela. It is always a pleasure to be working with you and collaborating with you on a panel as it is to uh, participate in Transatlantic AI Exchange. Kudos to, uh, to my friend Thomas for his entrepreneurial zeal and energy making this happen a great initiative. Uh, look, I think we've gotten a lot of really good impulses here over the course of this morning or evening, I should say, in Europe. Uh, greetings to Europe uh, already, uh, and uh, and one thing is is becoming very clear, at least over the last hour uh, that I was able to attend, and that is entrepreneurs in the cognitive era, as we say, the era in which we use AI to automate cognitive processes, um, are change agents for society. They're very very important for society, for upgrading society, every society, and as such, they deserve our support. Uh, and at the same time. We've also gotten, uh, I think, uh, good indications here, especially on the last two panels, when we're going into the human, whether it's in, 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 in pharma or bio, we heard human vector, we heard cyber, um, then of course we, we realize very quickly, uh, and you know, Salesforce incidentally is the glorious example of this, that in all these spaces, uh, economics uh, and ethics are tied by the hip right, uh, in this cognitive era. So we cannot ignore ethics if we ever thought we had that option. And, you know, I'm embarrassed to say that in too many areas around the economy, we thought we had that option for way too long. Uh, that has gone away with artificial intelligence and we have to confront this head on. So I'm very glad to be taking this entrepreneurially focused, but governance centric conversation uh, with Manuela Ford. With that, Manuela, why don't you open us up? I know you're going to take a macro level down and I will dock to that on the back end and close us out. Thank you so much, Olaf. It's always a pleasure with you. So coming from the compliance part, it was always my understanding to be a business enabler. And that means I have to anticipate risk from a holistic perspective. And that means I have to anticipate trends. I have to see business opportunities. I have to understand the business and to create value from my function as well. And so coming from the holistic perspective, it is starting with scale politics. World leaders are facing a new great power competition. This is the ability to use new technologies, unlock new economic potential, manipulate social media and threaten national security interests. 
So it is about competing for data and technology on one hand side, and for sure that means power and control. And the focus is on formulating and implementing AI policies that provide an economic and security advantage. So AI information flows will potentially drive the greatest regulations. As these information flows determine what citizens know or perceive about their own countries and events there, and that what they know and understand about global events. And so accurate information is critical to government decision and policies. So the government, and you see it, what is coming out, the rules from China and our other countries, which are now having their own policies and even cities, government is striving to build appropriate digital infrastructure, collect and control digital data. And for sure, the society is watching this. And that means there is a growing public criticism of technologies that collect data for commercial purposes, public surveillance and security. And so there is, and I influence as well, the uh, EU regulation with the things I had already implemented within Deutsche Telekom universe. So there is a European uh, maxim, level playing field for all who wants to do business with data in Europe. And so AI is about to become the central processing engine for all data. And the key element for the ambitious European data strategy is the AI regulation. And so this is a systematic promotion of value-based technology with a risk-based approach. And so it is about a new value-orientated risk management tool where we have a desire to have a specific risk classification to determine appropriate regulatory measures and now, and this is my evolution, uh, evolution, sorry, evaluation is for a deployment of a general abstract regulatory framework. It is still too early. This, what we now have in place as a draft, does not fit and could not transfer into the universe of different kinds of sizes of companies. So what is my plea? Confident in the digital future. And I'm absolutely convinced, and that is what I already established in, in Germany, is about an AI ethics ecosystem, about different actors, e.g. public authorities, legislator, industry, research, NGO, bringing them together, and a different kind of bundles of measures is required. But firstly, and this is very crucial, we have to have a definition and delimitation of technology. Then responsibility needs transparency about the modes of operation and possible consequences of AI deployments. So the interoperability and the necessary high quality of data must be ensured. And so the regulation is now more focusing on the risk assessment and diverse uh, um, uh, control points. So. Um, the risk assessment now is about transparency on one hand side, system related on, on the other hand side on application related risk. And it is what I established as well as Deutsche Telekom Group, and it is ethic by design. This is a setup as a mandatory factor from the beginning of the development process and implemented in, six, in existing procedures. You don't have the time and you don't have the money as a normal company to have extra bodies or extra procedures. So implement it in what you find in your company. And this is an important issue is the data quality. We label this as design by value. This is the most crucial part as well, because often you don't know which kind of sources do you have and what is the quality about the data in the end. And as well, and this is new, and I, I guess it is what you really need for the future, that is always a technology impact assessment regarding the use of the respective AI system. And for sure, it is the introduction of specific certification and standardization. One base for sustainable economic research and development is also a central component of the value chain. And the fundamental question in AI research, such as compatibility, explainability, robustness, and security, have not been clarified yet and require a further research efforts better exploit the full potential of AI. And so, the existing European AI Research Center need to collaborate more closely and collaborate with industry and public authorities. So, Olaf, this is my plea from my perspective and what I've experienced so far, and I find out that it worked quite properly. So, thank you so much, Olaf. Now it's your part.
All right. Thank you very much, Manuela. Always a tour de force. I appreciate that. Let me let me connect to a couple of things that you said. First of all, you started with, you know, with geopolitics, right? The Ukraine, uh, the, 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 the war of Russia and Ukraine. You know, many, many of us who are AI entrepreneurs might say, well, what the heck does that have to do with me? Might I remind everybody that Ukraine and Russia are the crypto capitals of this world? What's going to happen with crypto? What's going to happen with the AI solutions that entrepreneurs like we put in place to enable that? Um, you know, what is going to happen with, uh, with various digital actors using AI to cancel out Mr. Putin, for instance? So what I'm trying to say here is I can't go into this, but I'm happy to have offline dialogue that entrepreneurs are actually now being, uh, uh, you know, used by uh, both positive and illicit elements around geopolitics. Uh, weaponization is one term that we hear all the time. You have to be aware of the context on a high level. There are the what we call the Knights of the Cognitive Era that are innovating on AI as a national purpose around defense. There are those, of course, who are preoccupied with uh, the protection of the human being, notably the European uh, uh, Union, uh, you know, with phenomenal scientific and entrepreneurial talent, but very little ability to scale out globally. You have, of course, the Cambrian uh, countries, right, uh, that are using this for an explosion of economic opportunity, the United States and China. Um, and then you have the global networkers, you know, the Finlands of this world, the Canadas of this world to sort of blaze the trail, Singapore, uh, even UAE and India now globally networking to complement their assets. All of these countries are projecting their AI development values out alongside their political values. And you have to be cognizant of that. Can you influence that? No, most likely you can't, but you cannot be ignorant of it either because stakeholders are now uh, you know, taking us to task as it were. And I see this you know, in my day job when I'm teaching young entrepreneurs, young leaders, they're utterly conscious of this. And they're saying, look, we understand code. What we don't understand is humans and politics, and you have to start there. Now, where do you take it from there? You take it to your board. I want to give you an example of board-level governance that I find very admirable. I serve on the advisory board of Hayden.ai that does traffic monitoring, AI-supported. The entrepreneur, Chris Carson, uh, put an advisory board together, advising him on ethics, on safeguarding human centricity, uh, very much in line with what other companies, notably also Salesforce, are doing. Then you have to do social impact assessment with every solution you propose. Here again, Salesforce, glorious example, Kathy Baxter, what a fantastic job she is doing. If anybody wants to get a great job on ethical architecting, you know, that's a glorious role model right there. And she teaches us that we don't have to slow entrepreneurs down. We don't actually have to slow solutions time to market down. We get that that is really important. And so you, she said, if you involve us early and if you involve stakeholders early in things like co-creative design, get feedback early, these stakeholders will be more collaborative, co-creative, and can help you de-risk the product development process. Then, of course, you have to do algorithm models and also uh, audits and also data logs, right, to make sure that you understand who's collecting data for my algorithms, how biased are they? We're all biased. Nobody is bias free. Um, that doesn't mean we're bad people. It means our brains got designed to have biases and we need to mitigate them. So those four levels of corporate oversight, social impact testing, down to algorithm auditing, down to um, uh, data logs and data um, uh, really labels uh, in just in terms of uh, uh, you know logging who is collected, how are they processing the data, how are they cleaning the data or not, really important. At the end of the day, though, the most important thing for all of us who are entrepreneurs, who are entrepreneurial executives is start to talk to your stakeholders early, to your regulators early, create sandboxes, go into markets where regulators are willing to create a sandbox to let you play in a safeguarded way to then scale out bit by bit and de-risk your solution. See, the fallacy is to think that ethics governance has to slow you down, has to wreck your solution, but it doesn't. It can make you faster uh, because you don't have the backlash to contend with either from a heavy handed regulator or from the public and social media. So to play with regulators and stakeholders and sandbox is really important. Another global 
uh, and glorious example here is, of course, Rwanda with their drone uh, regulation facilitated by the World Economic Forum, experimentation on the ground, cutting edge regulation around the pilot case. See, a lot of times when we have pilot cases, the highfalutin principle conversations that we have on a global level, they go away. Uh, the conflicts go away because people see the solution as it is on the ground can actually be risk mitigated fairly easily, right? So that's what it all boils down to. Mind the four levels, keep an eye on the context, but experiment on the ground because that's where the rubber hits the road. So with that, I'm going to close out here. I know we're a little behind time anyway. Thank you so much, Manuela, for teeing us up. And uh, I suppose back over to you, Thomas. Excellent. Thank you, Manuela, and thank you, Olaf. Um, it's yet another example that the topic in itself is incredibly important and needs to be discussed further in much more depth. It is important for the overall AI ecosystem, so I will definitely invite you and other people who have similar ideas and value to share to create another independent type session around this topic to really have a deep dive conversation about, about all of this. Now with that in mind, yes, it is correct. We are running only five to 10 minutes behind, probably 10 minutes. I can only assure everybody, please stay with us. Um, spend the additional 10 minutes with the next panel. We have five experienced entrepreneurial startup uh, CEOs participating in the conversation, moderated by Ragnar Kruse. Ragnar is the founding partner and managing director of the AI Fund and co-founder of AI Hamburg and AI Invest. In addition to that, Ragnar Kruse and also my dear friend Peter Forsteer are both my partner in crimes of bringing you all the transatlantic AI exchange to you virtually um, every single month. So with that, Ragnar, take it from here, please. Thanks, Thomas. And also thanks, Olaf. I could continue listening to you for the next half an hour for sure. So um, very happy to moderate this session. I'm Ragnar Cruz. Um, Thomas already made the introduction partner of, uh, at AI Fund, a venture fund investing in European AI companies, co-founder of AI Hamburg, Transatlantic AI Exchange, AI for Germany, and least not last, the AI Startup Hub in, in Hamburg. Yeah. So a lot around AI startups. AI startups are, are the speedboats for innovation to make our world better. So therefore, let's collaborate, let's work together, join the transatlantic AI exchange. Yeah, so uh, let's, uh, and so now let's hear some of those founders of AI startups from Europe about the learnings, AI use cases and opportunities and what they have to say. So therefore, I would uh, move to our first one, uh, George. George, please, you have the stage. Thank you, Ragnar. So I'm, I'm George Frangu, I'm Massive Analytics founder and group CEO. And this evening I'm going to give a brief talk on explainable AI and why it's absolutely necessary for value creation and not just in the latest uh, line of AI sound bites. So AI has become something of a buzzword in the last decade. You know, many claim to be creating it, many want it for themselves or their business, some even fear it. But the stats show that AI as a decision-making tool for enterprises is far from mature. Most enterprises face all kinds of barriers to adoption. Some of these are technical, some data governance related, skill shortages and the like. However, the biggest and most common stumbling block is culture, in other words, trust. I think it goes without saying that to begin creating value from AI, we must first implement it. But most businesses are reticent to hand over decision-making to a machine. Why is that? Well, it's twofold. One issue is accuracy. Do I trust that the AI has got it right? Will it get it right repeatedly? Not just to create value, but to prevent losing value. Secondly, how can I know if the AI has got it right without taking the plunge when the processes the AI uses to make predictions and make decisions aren't easily understood? AI should be about de-risking decision-making, helping you make the right decision at the right time. But a black box, an unexplainable AI does the complete opposite. It introduces risk into the business and the minds of decision makers. 
This risk is being held accountable for decisions that aren't adequately understood or worse, making a wrong decision. Yet businesses can't afford to sit on the fence about AI in today's digital world. All their competitors who use AI to make data-driven decisions will overtake them. Therefore, explainability must be front and center to create value from AI, to create responsible AI. Responsible AI is a term we're seeing appear in the media more and more, from the World Health Organization to Microsoft to NATO. Organizations, businesses, and government bodies are all talking about responsible AI, which among other things requires making AI explainable. But what's meant by explainable AI? Well, another word for it might be interpretable, putting the processes behind the AI into simple business language, explaining the connections that are being made and having traceability to follow the AI's journey from data to decision. Then there's transparency. How many times has AI made the news for the wrong reason? You could detect bias and protect against techniques that might have misinterpreted the data before entering circulation with transparency. Remember, the AI must be accurate to create value. Well, suppose you can characterize an AI model, its accuracy, fairness, parameters with the outcomes. In that case, you can train that model better, get more accurate insights, avoid missteps, and therefore create even more value. Beyond just trust, we're moving towards regulations being put in place to govern the development of AI for the first time. The EU's AI Act looms large here. Explainability in AI will soon become fundamental if you want to use AI at all, whether you're a vendor or a consumer. Making your AI traceable, transparent, and therefore explainable opens the door for broader adoption of AI, for more buy-in from stakeholders and ultimately more value creation. The actual value of AI isn't just in insights it reveals, but in how those insights are automated. But unless that AI complies with regulations, is without bias, is trusted enough to embed into our businesses, well, we'll never see the full reward and full value creation will be left unrealized. Thank you. Thank you, George. Explainable AI. Now, for, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Raluca. Raluca, stage is yours. Hi, thank you so much for, for having me here. Um, yeah, I'm the CTO of Ethic, um, and I'll just kind of explain a little bit more about what we do at Ethic. And, you know, for us in a nutshell, we help you build robust machine learning systems. You know, it's systems like George was describing that, you know, you can trust, you know, that make you money, but also not detrimental to like a portion of society. And, you know, we've all heard the issues uh, that occur when companies do not really test these systems properly. Like people like, you know, Amazon's AI recruitment tool got pulled out because it was very biased and didn't let any female applicants through. The Apple card uh, credit scoring system, it was investigated for gender discrimination. Still, I was home flipping out of it. That was a major cause. Uh, you know, in, in losing Zillow about $500 million, you know, 25% of their whole business. You know, these are tech giants and even they having huge resources and large teams, you know, they're struggling. But everyone, literally everyone who built in this space from very large companies to very small companies is facing the same risks and really need to kind of address them head on. So. At Ethic, we kind of try to help people address them, and especially small companies, uh, because you know for them it's even tougher. Now we're a team of data scientists and engineers, and we have more than ten years of experience in the sector, and we're building the tools that we wish we had when we were kind of building our projects before Ethic. And you know it's unfortunately staying in machine learning a world where it says you know people say let's put it in production and kind of see what happens. And what we say is, please don't, you know, don't, don't just put in production and see what happens. <laughs> you know, probably nothing good will happen as a result of that. There are a lot of issues that can set up a system like this up for failure, you know, from the get go. And a lot of these issues can actually be prevented. And, you know, finding and fixing these issues earlier on means the model will perform better. You know, you won't have to waste time debugging a live system and your overall risk will be reduced. And, you know, our, our own approach and, you know, our tools are a lot about helping the people that build these systems, helping data scientists, helping them, the ML engineers and the ML teams. Um, 
you know, test their systems more properly and have the testing in place from build, like, you know, as soon as, you know, like the data stage through to build and through to production. Because, you know, you have, you can have a lot of issues, you know, from leakage accuracy, unintended bias, and then you move on to drift, robustness, explainability, like George was mentioning. So all of these issues need to be tested and tested thoroughly and tested as, 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 as many stages as applicable in the process. And, uh, you know, different, different people have different approaches to this, but our approach is, you know, and because we, we're kind of trying to build for everyone in the sense so that, you know, the obstacle to, to use our tool is very low. So our tool looks like unit test essentially. And it's as easy to use and as modular as unit test that you can plug in wherever, whatever your environment is. But then behind this unit test, like, like the pipelines that are based on our research in the space, especially bias, but also drift and so forth. So that means because they're deeper, these pipelines don't just, uh, these unit tests don't just point out this issue, but point out exactly, but point out also the cause and help you fix it, which I think really helps people kind of, um, you know, deal with the ML risk problem. And, you know, um, the output from this test is also collated and aggregated for you so that, you know, the, the, everyone in the business can have a bit of an idea of, you know, how risky is this model, how accurate it will be, what's the potential of it, because really this, this ML risk problem is a problem for everyone. And, you know, I mean, we've, I think mean, I've been told, you know, have a call to action and our call to action is we're very passionate about this. We're very passionate about working with companies that are building these systems, working, partnering with organizations that share our goals. So, you know, whether you're building a system like this or whether you have a portfolio of companies that is, do get in touch with us. And, you know, we, we love to kind of talk to you and hear what, what you say and hopefully help you. So, yeah, that, that's us in a nutshell. Thank you, Raluca. You might post your LinkedIn uh, profile for contacting you also in the chat. Thank you much. Next will be Diva. Stage is yours. Thank you, Ragna. I'm Deva. So I'm the co-founder of Sound Analytics. We are a digital data analytics company um, within healthcare. And today for my message, I wanted to keep it really simple. And what I wanted to talk about was I was thinking, okay, what would be actually really useful? Because you know. Uh, for somebody who's an early entrepreneur or an early startup and I'm saying what did I wish that I knew or what actually helped us when we were starting and I tried to buy it down to like five main things that I wish we knew um, or that really helped us and I think the first thing is particularly within AI it's important that uh, for us at least it was important that whenever you're starting a startup company you know have a story um, and try to make sure that you're um, you know, product is set within a narrative. So like have a beginning and an end. So for us, we started with a simple use case and we developed it, you know, layer by layer from there. And I think that really helps, uh, particularly whenever you're trying to make a pitch and, you know, you're trying to get VCs and such interested as well. Um, and then the next thing is, um, which also linked to that, is that don't try to be a, you know, don't try to create a like a Swiss army knife situation where you have all these different branches. It's really easy to do that, I think, in AI, because whenever we're building models, they are data agnostic. Um, and also they're really easy to build into different areas and fields. So you do get tempted to do this. And while that's brilliant, if you're a mature company or, you know, you have a bit more staff and a bit more resources, I think at the start, if you try to go down the route of you're going to build all these different branches and come up with all these lots of different ideas, it is going to be tougher, um, particularly when you're trying to convince VCs. Um, and um, again, that is not to say you should ever stop research and development. It's just that you should try to focus on the main area, the main branch and perfect that before you try to bring into production any other branch, uh, branches or ideas you have. And the next thing for me was point three is um, it is a marathon and it's not a sprint. So any kind of, I think, startup, at least for us, what I needed to uh, have to learn was because this was my first time doing this, was that 
you know, you might have one good day, but that means you're probably going to have two bad days at the start straight after. So if you're not ready for that, if you don't, you know, mentally prepare yourself for that, you and your team is going to burn out really quickly. So it's very important, I think, to, um, you know, like enjoy the, the, the smaller victories that you get. Because if you try to keep like waiting for the bigger victories, which is what something I did, because I was like, no, no, I need this to be perfect. You know, I'll wait for the next, the next. But it's, there's never a next it's always like you know there's always a bigger goal that you need to achieve so you know just pace yourself for us was really important and the next thing i think uh george already mentioned this you know there's the big hype when it comes to ai at the minute um so i think you need to be a bit careful because like so for example with us in sonry we use both, uh, so we use AI, but we also have, uh, you know, general statistical pipelines that we use whenever we're analyzing our data as well. So we're very careful where we embed AI within our product, um, because I think it is important to understand, um, because like, you know, just like with Raluca said, with AI, you know, you have the factors where you have to make it explainable, you have to make it ethical. So there are other things that you need to think about. So if you try to embed AI for the sake of embedding AI and you know to make it sound cool to your customers or your VCs, you are gonna end up in a bit of a model. So it's important to make sure that within your product, you identify where you need it and for what customers you need to use AI um, and go with that. And then the final point I would say um, is that, you shouldn't be afraid of criticism. And especially, I think it's important that you should not try to take any criticism that you get um, personally, especially if you're a founder or if you're the person who developed your product, it's very easy um, whenever you get, you know, you get the no from a VC or your customer isn't like, you know, getting the product, like they're not quite happy. It's very easy to feel like personally offended. At least I did feel like that at the start. But the thing is you need to make sure that you don't take it personally. Uh, and it's a really good thing. You want them to tell you what's wrong or you want them to tell you what they're actually thinking. And it really helps for you to um, develop your models and make sure that, um, you know, you're doing a better job. But yeah, so I wanted to keep it like really simple. Uh, but yeah, that's that's um, that's my piece. Hi, Deva. Thank you very much. Thanks for advice and never give up. Finally, I would like to give the word to Vladislav. The stage is yours. Yeah, so um, on the topic of uh, value creation AI, um, I can share an example uh, from the autonomous driving industry, uh, which of course has the potential to uh, create tremendous value in, in uh, multiple trillion dollar markets. To give you some context, um, I've been working in computer vision AI for almost 17 years now, um, since the early days of the DARPA grant challenges. Um, back then, some of the bottlenecks to autonomous driving, such as computer vision, seemed uh, roughly insurmountable. Um, but with the advent of deep learning, it became possible to make a great deal of progress towards solving computer vision. Um, however, um, technological progress um, has been overestimated at certain junctures in the development uh, of the autonomous driving space. Um, you know, in particular, there was a lot of hype um, in 2016, which culminated in the acquisition of um, Cruise by GM that year. And, uh, as an, you know, if you were an outsider looking in, it looked like the space was kind of getting saturated, um, but it was actually uh, one of the best times to create a lot of value in a space via new approaches. Um, in particular, um, it, it was clear that, um, you know, regardless of how many resources applied um, using existing AI techniques at the time, it would not result in a fully self-driving car. Um, in, in particular, uh, you know, fully supervised machine learning methods uh, will never really result in AI systems with the levels of accuracy required to get to fully autonomous driving. Um, and that's because building a human level accuracy computer vision system may require training on trillions of images, which would be impossible to annotate for, um, you know, supervised learning approaches. So it was clear really to anyone with sufficient technical depth in AI that a scalable self-driving deployment would not occur on the several year timeline that, you know, the timelines that were kind of publicly being discussed in 2016. Um, and this is in part what motivated me and my co-founder um, to start Helm.ai because it was clear to us that we could create a lot of value in the space by innovating in the field of unsupervised machine learning. Um, Several years into the journey, um, we have created a new type of unsupervised learning called deep teaching, 
which combines sophisticated mathematical modeling with deep learning to train neural networks on large data sets without requiring human annotation. Um, it, it, typical unsupervised learning uses naive mathematical models, uh, which results in learning systems that learn at a much lower rate uh, than supervised methods, um, resulting in either inadequate results or systems that are too expensive to scale in of themselves. Um, deep teaching, in contrast, uh, leverages sophisticated mathematical models and methods of compressive sensing to create learning pipelines with a, with a rate of learning that's on par with supervised learning systems, but without requiring the huge costs of annotation associated with, with a supervised learning. Um, and what this uh, technology called deep teaching has allowed us to do is to basically rapidly scale our software um, to build cutting edge high end ADAS autonomous driving systems for the highway. Um, and we're now in the process of developing an advanced urban driving prototype. Um, and all these autonomous driving systems primarily use computer vision um, without requiring LIDAR sensors or HD maps. Um, so going, you know, the same way that even say supervised methods for building advanced computer vision systems seemed impossible back in 2006, and became possible, um, uh, you know, a decade later. Um, unsupervised learning looked intractable in 2016, but actually, we are now in the position of having scalable unsupervised learning methods that will solve computer vision in the coming years and will make large-scale L4 deployments possible. Um, and so, the punchline here is that uh, you know, choosing the right approach and timeline to scale that approach is critical. Um, you know, while dramatically scaling an autonomous driving company in 2016 uh, seemed pretty fruitless to us uh, because the technology simply wasn't there yet. Um, and indeed, you know, most companies that, you know, tried the blitz scaling approach in 2016 did not actually survive. Um, you know, it is now 2022 and it's absolutely the right time to scale uh, up autonomous driving efforts toward out of volume deployments because this better approach to L4 technology is now maturing. Um, and in particular, um, this capability of um, Helm AI technology to scale the right way depended critically on focusing on the appropriate and supervised learning technologies in the last few years, um, technologies which were not prioritized by companies with earlier growth and inflection points. Nice, Lev. Thank you very much. Yeah. Look forward to this to get around all the constructions in Hamburg in an autonomous um, um, car. Thank you very much. And I here I hand over to Adam and Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know we are a little bit over time, but I would say um, thank you very much to all speakers, getting 24 individuals who are busy with their own calendars and, and running their own businesses. Um, I hope the audience appreciates that the time spent by individual here in this session and sharing the knowledge, the preparation of the team behind this whole thing, this was an enormous, successful conference. I personally got a lot of value out of the individual's feedback. I want to big time thank Adam for cooperating with me on this incredible idea. And hopefully we see each other in October and there are Tyke sessions in between. Again, we're looking for speakers, follow us on Tykes. But the last work, I would like to give the honor to Adam. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. I thought it was a really, really good conference. Um, they're amazing speakers and uh, after two hours we still have over 300 people that's incredible it's unheard of uh, we had over 1200 people throughout the event uh, and I'm really looking up to the follow-up which is most important so the, the further Tykes events and also the conference we're doing in October looking forward to it thanks everyone thank you everybody stay safe bye